Luke chapter 2, this morning, verses 25 through 32. We'll, I'll begin reading at verse 25, and if you would join me on verse 26, and then every other verse down through verse 32, here this morning out of Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 32. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Heavenly Father, so grateful. I I have a hard time even expressing my gratitude that we can have church today. I guess we never know what we have until we no longer have it. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be grateful for every moment we spend in this place. And, Lord, for those dear ones who are listening online because they cannot attend their church, may they not pay attention to those men and women whom they read online who say that they're not in church because they're not at church, but they can't even be in their church. I pray that we might encourage them today because they attend with us online. But Lord, what good would it be and what good would it do if you do not meet with us here in this building? And I pray, dear Holy Spirit of God, that as we meet here today, you would visit each one of us in our hearts and may we understand the scriptures and may we learn from it and be challenged i ask it in jesus most precious name amen all right it's not even december yet but my message title today is preparing for christmas preparing for christmas christmas day is 26 days away from right now And so it's on its way. It's been said that I suppose that it's true, but the day after Thanksgiving is supposed to be the busiest shopping day of the year. Well, personally, I wouldn't know. (laughs) Personally, I wouldn't know because traditionally, I do not get out on the day after Thanksgiving and do anything. I'm still digesting my meal from the day before. And I prefer that. And I don't like to drive in traffic where people are crazy and and uh, speeding and pushing you out of the way, I just soon stay home. Doesn't bother me at all. What I want to get during Christmas time for others is probably going to be there uh, a long time after Black Friday. Now, what if you miss the sales? That's okay. I'll also miss that bad driver, and that's headed straight toward me and in a hurry to get his 52-inch television set or whatever he's going to get. One time I heard a radio commentator ask this question. He said, how do you prepare for Christmas? And today I want to bring a message about preparing for Christmas. I know that Jesus was not born on December the 25th, as is traditionally believed and practiced, but that's all right. It is the day that has been set aside that we celebrate his birth. Many have criticized days like Christmas and Easter And they give you all the history and uh, who celebrated it on what day and all the rest of it. And I just want to say today publicly, probably we'll get criticism from somewhere. But you know, I'm just glad for a couple of days a year when the whole world hears about Jesus. And Christmas is one of those days. And you can't say Christmas without saying Christ because Christmas, the first few letters is the word Christ. And as far as Easter goes... And there are those who preach against saying Easter and all the rest of it. I just want to say I'm thankful for a day that everybody gets to hear about a living Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. And he is living today. And I don't criticize any of that. I remember many years ago, we had a very large family who visited our church for just a few minutes. 
and we're standing at our missionary board and they said, we might as well get this out of the way right now. And I said, and what's that? As I was greeting them before the service started, they said, do you, uh, do you celebrate Christmas and Easter here in your church? And I said, yes, we celebrate the birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ in our church. And they said, that's all we needed to hear. And they walked out and never came back. I guess they didn't want anything to do with Easter or Resurrection Sunday or a church that would celebrate his resurrection and didn't want anything to do with Christmas for whatever the reasons may be. And, and the truth of the matter is they left and never came back. I wish they would have stayed. I think that we could have helped them along the way. But in actuality, Jesus is more than likely born sometime near the end of September on our calendars. And uh, that's always up to conjecture. But the study that I've done sort of takes me that direction. But that's not necessarily what I preach or what I teach. The fact, that fact is neither here nor there. The important thing is, is that Jesus was born, lived a sinless life, uh, died a vicarious death for the sins of every man, and rose from the dead on the third day. That's the important thing to remember. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. Uh, listen, we have a living Savior, and I'm glad that he was born. And I don't mind that the rest of the world looks at the Savior as being born in December. It doesn't matter to me. But how do you prepare for Christmas? How did they prepare for the arrival of the Son of God in the Bible? I mean, how did they prepare? Well, first of all, if you're taking notes and you want to write some things down, might come in handy for you to know this because they prepared for what we would call Christmas Day. They prepared for the coming of the Savior. First of all, the prophets foretold it. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophecies throughout the Bible concerning the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. I like what Jesus did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. While they were still not able to recognize him, the Bible says that he opened up the scriptures from Moses all the way through the prophets and showed every scripture in the Bible that prophesied of the coming Messiah, of his death and his resurrection. That little babe in the manger was more than just a baby in a manger. He was the very son of God. The Bible says in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, uh, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 may be the most well-known scripture concerning what the prophets had to say. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There are many today who combine the words wonderful and counselor, and though that may be true of him, he is called wonderful, which is different than the word counselor. He is both, and I thank the Lord for that. You see, the world needed a savior because all men are sinners. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 simply says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The world needed a savior because all men are sinners. For the wages of sin is death. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, Jesus was that savior prophesied by the prophets of old. Jesus was to come and Jesus did come. And you know, I love the story that we read at the very beginning of this message here about the man Simeon. He got to hold Jesus in his arms. He held the Son of God and he says, my eyes have beheld the salvation that God promised. And he held that little baby. He says, now I can die in peace. Can you imagine being Simeon on that day? That's one of the, to me, one of the dearest and most precious stories in all the word of God is what we read here in Luke chapter two. And the prophets said that he was coming and Simeon said, and I'm holding him right now. I'm holding him right now. He recognized Jesus as the savior, as the Messiah. And the prophets prepared for Christmas by telling the good news that a savior was coming. 
But secondly, some of the people actually believed it. Did you know that? We were just read a moment ago in Luke chapter 2, a man by the name of Simeon believed what the prophets preached. Oh, and today there are many disbelievers and there are many unbelievers. And in the days of old, there were many who disbelieved and many who refused to believe. But one man, Simeon, kept his eyes on the skies. He kept looking for the one that was promised. He believed what the word of God says. And notice what it says here in verses 25 and 26. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was looking forward to Jesus coming. He was looking forward to a Savior that was promised. Is there any wonder in the Word of God where the Bible says there is a reward, a crown that is prepared for people that love his appearing? We read about Simeon, and it says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. <laughs> and after he held him, he says, now I can die. Now I can die. Mine eyes have seen that consolation of Israel come. Mine eyes have seen the Savior my hands have held the Messiah in my own hands and in my own arms. I've seen him. Now I can die. And uh, did he go out and die that day? No. But God said he wouldn't see death until he saw Jesus. What a tremendous thing. You see, but he was willing to wait on the Lord. He wasn't like so many today that because Jesus has not returned uh, yet as he's promised he would do, they no longer preach about it. They no longer think about it. They no longer think about the rapture of all believers. They no longer think about Jesus coming back for his own. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Oh, they've stopped thinking about him. They've stopped talking about him. Oh, not Simeon. Simeon, I bet it permeated his thinking all the time. I bet when he got up in the morning, he probably said, like some of us might say, Lord, is it today? Is it today? Many years ago, Dr. Jack Van Impey, he had a little lapel pen that he offered to those who would uh, support his program and all that. I don't know how I got one because I never sent him a dollar, but I believed in everything that he said. God bless him. And I've still got it. It was a little lapel pen. It was a trumpet and it said on it, perhaps today, perhaps today, Jesus could come back today. And you know, there are those who love his appearing yet today. And I wonder if Simeon got up in the morning. I wonder if he had a lapel pen that said perhaps today. Didn't have a, a trumpet on it, but had a little manger, a little, a little cradle. <laughs> you never know what they offered back then. But every day, and then he'd go to bed at night and maybe say, well, Lord, it wasn't today. Are you going to come through the night? Uh, is the Savior, am I going to meet him tonight? But if he didn't come and get to meet him in the nighttime, I want, he woke up the next day and said, well, Lord, another day passed. Uh, God, is the Messiah coming today? Am I going to be able to see him today? You said that I wouldn't die until I saw him. And Lord, I'm still alive, so he must still be on his way. But I'm an old man, so it must be not long. It must be not long. And some of the people believed it. You see, he lived with his eyes open and waited for the appearing of that promised Messiah. He couldn't wait. Would God there were Christians today who lived in anticipation of the coming of the Lord Jesus? Would God there were Christians today who looked forward to that day when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first and the angel will shout and the dead in Christ will rise first? Uh, too bad there aren't Christians today that are thinking about that. Too busy caught up in maybe the time of the year. Some of the people prepared for Christmas by watching for the Savior to come. And the, by the way, there were others besides that. <clears throat> Which brings me to point number three. Mary lived in anticipation of it. Did you know that? See, Mary was the chosen young virgin girl that would bear the Son of God by way of a miracle. And God did this by way of a miracle. And Mary knew what the scripture said. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Jesus. She never knew a man. She'd never been immoral. All so many of the new translations, if you want to call them that, have changed the word virgin to young woman. Uh, but that is so inaccurate. Yes, yeah, she was young. and Yes, she was a woman, but she was also a virgin woman. Virgin in her heart and virgin in her body and virgin in her spirit. Yes, and God chose her. Of all the women that could have been chosen, he chose her. 
And uh, the Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Every young girl who loved the Lord kept herself pure during those days. Just like Simeon anticipated the coming of the Lord. Every young girl who loved the Lord and loved the scriptures knew Isaiah 7.14. And many of them kept themselves pure. Never got involved immorally with anyone. Uh, and for the longest time did not get married. And just like Mary... And uh, they, they loved the Lord. They kept themselves pure in anticipation of being that chosen one because God said it was going to happen. He said, behold, a virgin shall conceive. Well, that's a miracle within itself. But I guess that meant those who had been immoral or those who uh, were no longer virgin in their mind and in their body and in their spirit would not be the chosen one. So some of those young women looked forward to that, that maybe God would choose them. Who knows? They might have been the one. Well, it wasn't them, but it was one. And uh, when I think about that, had she not been a virgin, she could not have been the mother of the Savior. You know, Mary was quite a remarkable young girl. She really was. I don't know how old she was. Uh, some have said she was just a young teenager. Others have conjectured that she could be a much older than that. But regardless how old she really was, I kind of tend to believe that she was a teenage girl. But let me show you something about her three delightful facts about Mary. Number one, Mary was saved. Did you know that? Well, of course she was saved. Luke chapter one and verse 47, the Bible says, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my savior. Your Bible has a capital S on that word savior, doesn't it? That's because she trusted in the savior that was promised to come. And by the way, I want to say this. There are some today who believe that Mary was sinless. No, she wasn't. She said, you have to understand that only a sinner needs a savior. And she called God her savior. She was a sinner like the rest of us, but she was uh, pure in her mind and pure in her body and pure in her emotions. And she, God had chosen her and only a sinner needs a savior. So first of all, we understand that Mary was saved because she called God her savior. Secondly, Mary was submissive to the will of God. And would God, there were more of us today that were submissive to the will of God in our lives. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1 and verse 38, and Mary said, behold, by the way, one of the sweetest verses in all the story of Christ is what I'm going to read right now. What Mary, what Mary said when the angel told her what was about to come about in her life and she did not say, not me, Lord. She said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy will, according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. She didn't fight it. She said, okay, if that's what God wants, not a problem. She said, I'm God's handmaid. Whatever he wants, I'll do. Whatever he says, I will do. Where he sends, I will go. Oh, so many uh, good songs have been written through the years about submissive spirits to the will of God. And Mary set that forth for us in the word of God when she said, behold. She said, look here. Look at me, she said to Gabriel, the handmaid of the Lord. That's what I'll be. She was saved. She was submissive. But thirdly, did you know that she was filled with the scriptures? That's right. She knew the scriptures. Look at Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 46 through 55. Let me show you something that she did. And then you're going to have to write fast because I'm going to give you some references. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46, it says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, his, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats he, and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath set, sent away empty. He hath hoped the, his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. See, Pastor, what does that say about the scriptures? You may want to remember this. It must have been a beautiful thing to hear. Because her entire statement here is scripture. 
Did you know that? What she said was made up of 16 verses from the Old Testament. Uh, starting with Genesis and ending with Isaiah. Now, I'm going to give you these references twice if you want to write them down. You're welcome to go look them up. But by the way, she just started spouting off scripture. She didn't pull out a scroll. She didn't pull out the Dead Sea Scroll. She didn't pull out a King James Bible. She didn't pull out an Old Testament. She didn't pull out a Torah. These are things she had put into her heart. And it was thy word of I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 11, and here are the verses that she used. Genesis 17 and verse 7. Genesis 17 and verse 19. Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1. In the Psalms, she had 33 and verse 10. 34, verses 2 and 3 and verse 10. And then uh, she had Psalm 71 and verse 19. Psalm 98 and verse 1 and verse 3. Psalm 103 and verse 17. Psalm 111 and verse 9. Psalm 138 and verse 6. And Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 10. I'll give them to you again because some of you were writing them down. She used these scriptures. She had them put to memory. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And Jesus said, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Mary had him in her heart. She was saved, she was submissive, and she was full of the scripture. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7 and verse 19. Exodus chapter 20 verses 5 and 6. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1. Psalm 33 verse 10. Psalm 34 verses 2 and 3 and verse 10. Psalm 71 and verse 19. Psalm 98 and verse 1 and verse 3. Psalm 103 and verse 17. Psalm 111 and verse 9. Psalm 138 and verse 6, and Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 10. Wasn't it Jesus who said to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus that while they still didn't recognize him, he opened up the scriptures and showed them all the scriptures from Moses all the way through the prophets? Sounds like Mary was acquainted with the same scriptures, doesn't it? And she sang. And she said these words. People have come to me and said, Pastor, can you help me? I need some help and encouragement in my heart. And I will say, well, let me give you some scripture. I think I can say a lot of good things, but anything I say is not near as good as what the Bible has to say. And often I will send them 1 Peter 5, 7, about casting your, all your burden on the Lord because he cares for you. Or about peace where Jesus said, my peace I give unto, the, unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Time and time, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Uh, so, uh, Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, there's so many scriptures. And I will just share with them scriptures because they need some comfort. They need some comfort from the Lord. Sometimes uh, maybe uh, someone would have uh, lost a child in birth. And that happens from time to time. We have two children in heaven, and there are many families that have uh, children that they never got to see the light of day. But what do you say to someone who lost a child in, in childbirth or lost a child through miscarriage? Well, there's a story in the Word of God where David had a little baby that was born, David and Bathsheba. And that baby, after seven days, died. And the scripture says uh, they were trying to get David to, to, to get up and do something. He says, well, now you're taking a shower and you're cleaning up and you're eating. And, and uh, you ought to be mourning because the child died. And David simply said, well, one of these days, he says, I'll get to go be with that child. Though the child can never come back to me. I thought, wow, what comfort from the scriptures. 
Mary was filled with the scriptures. You see, Mary had put herself and her personal desires on the shelf and wanted nothing but the smile of God on her life. Mary prepared for Christmas by living like she belonged to God already. And by the way, if you're a Christian, that's who you belong to. You're not your own. The Bible says you're bought with a price. We ought to live like we belong to him. And that brings us to the question that was asked at the start of this message. How do you prepare for Christmas? Well, uh, what they did in Bible times may give us some suggestions. Listen very carefully. Number one, as the prophets did, so we should tell people about the Savior. That's what they did. They prophesied that the Messiah was coming. Well, in our day, the Messiah is not coming. The Messiah has already come. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verses 15 through 18, And it came to pass, and the angels were gone away from uh, them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. They said, Jesus is here. Maybe we should do the same thing. I have said to you time and again, on your way out of this auditorium, reach to your left and grab a handful of Christmas tracts and give them to people during this season. Yes, it's simply God's simple plan of salvation. The tract that was written by Ford Porter in the 1960s and revised by his son uh, in the 1990s. Marvelous little track in hundreds of languages and tens of thousands have come to faith in Christ because of it. Grab those tracks, give them to people. It's got a Christmas decoration front on it. It's for the season and tell people about Jesus. Say, it's not my personality. All right, then change your personality. And if you can't do that, then just simply give people tracks and say, here, everybody gets one. Read this. It's got some good news in it. And often when I'm in a restaurant, I'll say, here, let me give you this. It tells you about heaven and how to get there just from the Bible, from the word of God. As the prophets did, we should tell people about the Savior. Number two, as some of the people did, we ought to believe that God came down to dwell with his people, that he might redeem them. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, the word of God says, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. A peculiar people? I remember when I was a young Christian, I always said the word peculiar doesn't mean you're supposed to stick out like a sore thumb until I studied the word peculiar. And guess what it means? It means exactly that. You're to be as different from dark is, that dark is from light, as white is from black, as good is from evil, as righteousness is from unrighteousness. You're supposed to stick out like a sore thumb. Not obnoxious, but you're to be different. No wonder the word of God says, wherefore come out from among them, saith the Lord, and be separate. He wants us to be a peculiar people. And what we need to do is we need to believe that he came down to redeem us. We need to believe that. Is Jesus your Savior today? Not a Savior, not the Savior of the world, but your personal Savior. I read a book one time that was kind of critical of modern-day Christianity. In fact, I got halfway through it, and I closed the book, and I gave it back to the fellow that gave it to me. And I said, I'm not going to read any more of this. And uh, they simply said that the word, the term personal Savior was brought about in the days of D.L. Moody. He said, it's not even scriptural. And I thought, well, when I received Jesus, it was for me. That's pretty personal. And I get to go to heaven. That's pretty personal. And he forgave me of my sins. And that's pretty personal. I received a personal Savior. And I'm glad that he is. Let me ask you this. Is he your personal Savior today? So first of all, how to prepare for Christmas is, as the prophets did, tell people about the Savior. Secondly, as some of the people did, believe that God came down to dwell with his people that he might redeem them. And thirdly, do as Mary did. So we should live pure lives so as to please the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I'll go into a store, I'll go into a restaurant, and they always want to give you a discount because you look old. 
And if you don't look all that old, they, they say, are you in the military? And I always say the same thing every time I say, I'm in the Lord's army. And they always laugh. And if they were raised in church, then they know what I'm talking about. If they were not raised in church, they look at me like a calf looking at a new gate and trying to figure out what kind of a crazy nut I am. I said, the Lord's army. I remember one waitress said, I like that. I've never heard you. I said, that's the first time I've ever heard that in my life. And that is really good. I did not get a discount. And I thought, well, at least give me one because I'm old. There you go. But as Mary did, we ought to live our lives so as to please the Lord. The Bible says, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Living a life that is pleased. You know, the news in recent months has been filled with negative things. I mean, hurtful things. Uh, it got to the place in my own life. And by the way, I'm sort of a news nut. I'm like a lot of folks. I, I like to watch the news. I really do. And uh, in recent days, I've just had to turn it off. I'll maybe catch a glimpse of what's going on, then I'll turn it off. Or I'll, uh, I'll, and every morning, I, had, I have a habit. I'll tell you about one of my habits. Every morning, uh, I would get in my car, and I would turn on my radio, and I would listen to a newscast. Now I don't do that. I say, what do you listen to? Christmas music. I did that in July. <laughs> I did that in August. I listen to Christmas music all year long. And I don't mean Santa Claus is coming to town and, and Grandma got run over by a reindeer. I don't mean that. I mean, I listen to the good stuff. They're really pretty. We were playing Christmas music this morning uh, before the service started and, and before Sunday school came. And in between Sunday school and the morning service, I was playing uh, Christmas music here at the church. I say, what do, you, do you ever catch any news? Just enough so that I know what's going on, and then I turn it off. We had a lot of negative news these days. And that doesn't make you want to live for the Lord sometimes. Sometimes it just makes you angry to see what's going on. My pastor said for years that his secretary would open up all of his mail, and if there were criticizing letters in it, he would, she wouldn't give them to him. Uh, not constructive criticism, negative things being said. And he said, I like that because, he said, I don't want to fill my heart and my mind with negative things. Uh, when I come to this pulpit, I've not listened to the news. I've not listened to negative things. Because when I come to this pulpit, I want to be ready for you. I want to be ready to preach to you without having a big, heavy burden on my back. And boy, in the last number of months, we've had all kinds of negative things. We need to be a light in a sin-darkened world. That's what we need to be. Everywhere I go... What do I say to people? Howdy, howdy. Do I know them? No. What do I say to them? Howdy, howdy. And uh, they usually look up and say hi or howdy back or whatever or smile. I've met a few in recent days that I, I said howdy, howdy, and they wouldn't even look at me. I guess maybe I was that offensive. I don't know. Maybe they thought I was going to give them a bug or something. I don't know. But I try my best to be a light in a sin-darkened world. And that's what we ought to be. And what Mary was, was she lived a life that was pleasing to the Lord. One of the ways that she did that, hear me now, was she was filled with the scriptures. And anytime she needed the Bible, it was there in her mind and in her heart. She didn't have to get out a concordance or get out somebody's book or read a, a chapter from someone's book on a particular problem. She had them right there. And she started in Genesis and she ended in Isaiah and she sang that song and it was scripture the, all the way through. Would God, that was the way that all of us lived. So how do you prepare for Christmas? Too bad Christians do not get, get as caught up with Jesus as they do about the busiest shopping day of the year. I was watching the news the other night just for a little while because they had something about the busiest shopping day of the year and places. And there were some places where people lined up through the night to be the first one in to get their paws on the TV, I guess. And remember here in recent days, we had a brand new hamburger joint open up here in town. We now have, it's called an In-N-Out Burger. And one of my friends uh, here in Colorado Springs pulled his phone out and took a video as he was traveling, I believe it was along Powers Boulevard, and he was taking a, a video of all the cars that were lined up, up and down the road and around the corner. And then there was, in the newscast, there was 
there were people, it's like going to a, an amusement park, waiting for the ride, to ride the big roller coaster. They were lined up one row after another, just like that. And there were some people I read where one family had waited 12 hours to get a hamburger. I said to my friend, I said, why don't they just go to Drifters? It's the same thing. And same burger, same, same decorations, everything's the same, and you're not going to stand in line. And yesterday, when I got home from the church here, yesterday afternoon, I pulled the grill out and cooked hamburgers on the grill. The only thing I had to wait on was them cooking. Of all things, people get caught up, but they have anticipation of a hamburger or anticipation of a 62-inch television set or uh, anticipation of getting some kind of a deal on a Black Friday that they're not going to get any other time of the year. I just wonder how many of those folks have been thinking about anticipation of the Lord Jesus at all. And I don't mean to throw water on anybody's excitement, but what I mean is this. We ought to be permeated with the thought of the Lord coming. So here's my idea. Three little points and I'm done. I will walk out of here in a little bit. Let's do as the prophets did and tell people about the Savior. Let's just decide to do it. Secondly, let's do as some of the people did and believe that God came down to dwell with people that he might redeem uh, for himself a special people. And thirdly, let's do as Mary did so we should live pure lives so as to please the Lord. That's how I think that we should prepare for Christmas. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember is just to follow the biblical example of what they did to be ready for the Messiah when he showed up. I encourage you to go back sometime this week and read in Luke chapter 2 and read about Simeon one more time and then try to put yourself in his place as he held that baby in his arms and said, mine eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Shall we stand?